We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Patreon and patron Razul502, who asks, what different stages of the hobby have you experienced? What are your favorite games or memories from these stages? I'm asking because I'm curious about the long-term journey. I've been in the hobby for almost five years. My collection has increased to around 150, and my game style preference has changed many times. Currently, I'm more interested in decking out my games that I really enjoy instead of just constantly adding new games to the shelf. Great question there, Raswell. Um, and honestly, all of those steps sound very familiar to me. I personally have decided, I don't know, I, I just decided to coin a bunch of terms this episode because uh, feel free to use these or make up your own. Um, I decided to call this the the game collection and style change. I mean, we're going to call it the life cycle of a board gamer. Uh, and it's something, honestly, every gamer goes through um, from whenever they first discover the hobby to wherever they are now. And there are many ups, downs, steps forward, steps backs, and sometimes loops on this journey. It's most definitely not a straight line, and the path isn't going to be the same for everyone. While there are some commonalities, and there seem to be a few paths that many people take, mm -hmm. each gamer and game group is going to experience things differently. And then as well as not following the same path, the actual stops along the path may very well be different. And the end is going to vary where it stops or where they are now. Some groups have a very short journey, while others are still evolving with what they enjoy and the games they play are constantly changing. What we're going to talk about today is our paths, as well as mention other paths people we know have taken and some common paths that most gamers seem to follow. Mm -hmm. The important thing to note is that none of this has to be your path, and we may well miss the exact journey you or your group has had. And none of these paths are any better than any other. I think that's important to stress. Now, no matter what part path you take, it all starts by taking that single step and getting into the board game hobby. Everyone has to start somewhere, whether that's playing games as kids and never really leaving the hobby or discovering it much later in life. Now, I'm one of those people who never really had a distinct point where I became a hobby gamer. My dad was always into games and even hobby board games before they were really called that. This was like the, he was into Squad Leader and Upfront, as well as early Avalon Hill 3M and Sports Illustrated. Uh, back then, they weren't called designer games or hobby games. They're called bookshelf games because you stored them this way instead of being the long, flat, you know, Parker Brothers boxes. For me, I just grew up with games being a thing and like weird, strange games being a thing. Now, if I did have to pick a point from where I basically swapped from playing mass market kids games or just traditional card games to what most people would consider hobby games, that would be when I picked up a copy of Talisman at Leisure World at the Devonshire Mall. And that's what really led me on my current beer game journey. Sean, what about you? I know we played games together as a kid, but those were pretty much all mass market from what I remember. Indeed, I really knew nothing but mass market board games for really most of my, you know, uh, life up until uh, full adulthood. Uh, I was aware of some of those fancy games your dad liked, uh, but they seemed so incredibly niche and uncommon. Yeah. Uh, my family did love games. Uh, we played regularly more so than most families I knew. Uh, and while mass market there was a wide range over multiple decades in our collection mm -hmm. uh, that we, you know, it, it felt like a board game collection, even though it was technically more mass market. Uh, nowadays, I'm assuming the path of the lifelong gamer, right? The, the you were born into it and your parents played is probably a lot more normal than when Sean and I were growing up. Um, like I've met younger gamers that are like, oh, yeah, my parents played Catan. Or yeah, they play Ticket to Ride. I've been playing Ticket to Ride Christmas Eve for as long as I can remember. And while the growing number of people whose parents play D&D &D continues to grow as well. Yeah, gone are the days where Parker Brothers games from the Sears catalog are the only board games that families played. Yeah. Uh, next up for me is what I like to call the dark times. Uh, Stop playing. Stop playing board games, hobby games. Stop playing RPGs. Completely got out of it. Except for, you know, the occasional nostalgia-fueled game of Talisman, usually with some alcohol involved. 
Um, and well, I kept trying to get back into Warhammer Fantasy Battle. I don't know how many different times I tried to get back in, especially when they opened the Games Workshop store locally. Uh, but mainly, I didn't play tabletop games. I played a lot of video games, an awful lot, uh, with the PlayStation, the PlayStation 2, and uh, Nintendo 64 and all those. Now, I got to say, I think this step's pretty common for most gamers as long as they got into it as kids, right? It's not just you hit that stage in life where you're no longer hanging out with your old friends and the, the kids you grew up with and you're meeting new people and new groups. Uh, your people move away. Uh, people get jobs. They start becoming adults. People are getting married. Maybe kids happen. And generally, your priorities shift. Yeah, for me, it was university. Uh, I went away to university. I left Windsor and uh, moved up to Toronto. And while I'd already become an RPG fan before university and played some a little bit during first year university, afterwards, it was digital or nothing. Uh, between yeah. school and jobs, it was usually the computer, which was the go-to for relaxing, mind-numbing fun after a <laughs> long day. Uh, board games just weren't even at all in the equation. I mean, never, never even crossed the mind. And I was pretty much the same. I said every now and then it'd be like, hey, we should get together and play Talisman because we haven't done that in a long time. Uh, next up is what I would call the rediscovery phase, which for me happened when I, we were pretty settled down in life. Like I, things were still tumultuous and you were, you were young and stupid. But Dee and I were living together. We had our own apartment. I had a steady job. Dee was taking classes at school. And while disposable income was actually a thing that we were discovering for the first time. In life, and we finally realized maybe we shouldn't spend it all on pitchers of beer and pool downtown. Um, here we discovered Catan, specifically due to buying a games magazine before a trip up to London, Ontario on the bus and going, I'm gonna buy whatever's the number one game of all time because it was a game's top 10 and it was this game Catan that led to weekly game nights. Now, I've talked about this part of my gaming life many times, so I'm not going into the details, but we played a lot of Catan and then Catan with expansions. And then I imported stuff for Germany for Catan. Like behind me, I've got my copy of Dust Book, which is now like super rare and out of print. Um, we played a lot of Catan, as well as rediscovering some of the classic games in my collection. Uh, and of course, another attempt to get back into Warhammer Fantasy Battle, <laughs> uh, which uh, is when I started collecting. And, and we, we actually played a few matches this time instead of me just buying lots of miniatures. Yeah, and for me, it was quite a bit later when you and I reconnected uh, mm -hmm. after I'd stopped traveling and uh, we actually had bought our first home. Uh, I was I was actually available to, you know, have friends come over and had a place to have, have people come over and visit. Uh, and with games being such a big part of your life already, it was just mm. something I, uh, I accepted as easily as when I had taken up role playing uh, earlier in our friendship. You know, you, 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 were, you had already been involved in role playing and when we and we had reconnected after a short grade school uh, separation and uh, I jumped into role playing. And well, after the adult separation, you were board gaming. So I just started board gaming, too. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of that at that, that, that time. Heck, even now I bring games anywhere I go and I'm just like, well, of course, we're going to sit down. But what else are we going to do? Sit around <laughs> and talk? Well, we can do that over a game. Why, why would we just talk? Now, again, I think this is pretty typical, at least for anyone who took the path where they're on their way and got out and then came back. Um, and I got to say, Catan is where, man, I, I feel um, not hipster, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm just one of the pack, right? <laughs> this, is, this is pretty much a trope that people discover or get, get back into the hobby because of, of Catan and realize that, oh, these are better than the games I played as a kid. And yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those. I, Catan is partially responsible for this. See, and this is where uh, I widely diverge. Uh, I never really played Catan until much later and never really saw the fun in it when I did get to it. <laughs> um, while it's hard to say for sure, obviously, if Catan had been the gateway for me, I might have actually been turned off of gaming. Uh, instead, you showed up at my house with a box of different games to show me. And then this is the stage that, that I didn't go through, but Sean went through that I would call the, oh, wow, board games are actually fun stage. <laughs> Sean got to do this. I didn't. This is where you, you someone who wouldn't call themselves a gamer somehow discovers hobby board games and goes, wow, these are actually fun. Right. A friend brings a game over. You go to a board game cafe for the first time. You decide to go into a local game store or maybe the local comic book shop has a gaming night or the library. There are lots of ways to find hobby board gaming. 
And basically, it's the same as me rediscovering the hobby, but instead of rediscovering, it's discovering it for the first time. Now, again, Catan gets a lot of credit for this. Uh, more recently, I think uh, Ticket to Ride gets called out more often than Catan nowadays. And the one I'm seeing a lot of anymore is Wingspan being the first gateway for people. Now, I'm not calling it a gateway game. That sounds kind of gatekeepy, but it's the gateway to board gaming. We're going to use it that way. And I know gamers who got hooked on all kinds of games as their first game. Yeah, because because Wingspan is not a simple game by no. any means. It's <laughs> no. not what generally is considered a gateway game as an as an easy introduction to the hobby at all. No, I um, wouldn't say so. But I think it was Zuloretto uh, was the one I remember. I know you had a milk crate full, but Zuloretto yep. was the one I I seem to recall. Yeah, I've been trying to remember what I brought because if I remember correctly, Zuloretto was definitely the one we played. But I think I actually picked that up that day. At 401 Games, because I think it was one of those, we went up to Toronto, you and Sherry were working, and you weren't home, so like we hit downtown first and then made it to your place for dinner, and then played games after dinner. And I think that's what happened, I actually bought Zuloretto that day. Now, I cannot remember for the life of me what else I brought. I'm, I'd have to assume it was probably Carcassonne and Catan, but who knows? Yeah, it was uh, a rather eventful weekend for various unexpected yes. reasons. Uh, and the games did get overshadowed by events that really aren't appropriate to be discussed here. True. But uh, I, I, Zuloretto was, I think, the one we got to the table first. Yeah. So it definitely sticks out uh, before uh, events. All right. Next up for me and many other people is the Pokemon stage where you got to catch them all. Um, this sounds like where Razuel is right now. Uh, this one's extremely common in the hobby, and you're going to see it a lot. But the whole acquisition disorder that's meant jokingly, not that it's an actual disorder, um, the, the whole must get games is very much a, a certain type of gamer that gets into that. And they're also the certain types of gamer who like to go online and talk about it. And the certain type of gamer who likes to show up at game night and show off their new stuff. Right. Uh, this is not the average gamer, in my opinion. It's the average gamer you hear about. These people, I will say potentially not neurodivergent, who fixate on things, love data and stats and knowing more. The, the traditional geek, right? The geek, the nerd, whatever. I, as usual, part of this stage is you find Board Game Geek. That, that's, that's like a thing that all gamers eventually do. And then once you get there, you see that there's ranks. And then you find the top 100 and you see the hot list. And you start trying to find more information about these games. I think a little more common, like for me, that was like 2003. Um, this is also where nowadays you're going to have podcasts, top tens, board game, YouTube channels and Twitch streams. And while people like us are going to come in and be like, hey, you should check out this new thing. And you're like, oh, that sounds great. I must go get it. Now, we know you like games. You want more games like those games. So you start to research what are the games you may like, and then you go shopping. All I really have to say about this one is I own over 1,500 games, and I'm just talking board games, not role-playing games. Uh, the acquisition distorter hit me hard, and it's something I still deal with. Um, while we may not be reviewing the new hotness every week, I still pay attention to what that hotness is, and I got to admit, there's lots I would be tempted to buy. I would say it's not surprising that many hobby board games involve collecting things, but board games themselves are often collectors. Now, while I will often go all in on a specific game, like I did mm. with DC Deck Building, uh, I thankfully haven't had the urge to go full Pokedex, yes. uh, though that may in part be due to the sizable collection that I can play over at your house. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Access to games will change that. Now, this gotta buy them all phase does happen to most groups, but usually it's one person in each group for the reason Sean just mentioned. These tend to be the collectors, right? The hobbyists, the people who take it a bit more seriously than everyone else. I honestly don't think, though, that this is the average stage for an average gamer. The person on the street, the person comes to the house and plays games with you. But it's a very common stage for a certain subset of gamers, which are the ones we're usually interacting with pretty regularly online. It also hopefully tends to be the one who has the most disposable income available to use for a hobby like this yes. and it's not a debt uh incursion yes uh be careful with the gotta catch them all stage that you do not overspend all right this leads to the next stage which i'm going to call the curation this is when you got enough games that you need to start organizing them better 
you become more discerning in what you buy. You don't just buy games because they're a good deal, and you start to do research before buying your games. You'll look at a game you're considering buying and then think, hey, do I have anything in my collection that already scratches the same itch? Similarly, you're going to look at your collection kind of on the other way, though, and on the buying side and go, wait, do I, am I missing anything? Like, do I have a good auction game? I don't have a good auction game. Maybe I should pick one up. So this is the point where you stop buying. You're just being a little more careful about what you buy. This also leads to the world of shelfies, debates on storage forms, shelving, how to shelve your games, sometimes even to even more niche forms like box optimizations, game repackaging, custom inserts, or even if you've got the ability, custom components. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm pretty sure this is a step everyone reaches at some point, uh, though for some people it can take a long time to get there um, for a very long time. Every time Amazon had a buy two, get one free sale um, and I had a Han Solo, I would buy 12 new games on average every sale, if not more. Um, sure, I checked Board Game Geek to make sure they're not like a five or less, but as long as they were like a seven, I just bought them. I wasn't worried about having two similar games in my collection. Just wanted more games. I wanted to try them all. There was that point, like when you're a little kid and you go into like a bookstore for the first time and you see the proprietor and you wonder if they've read all the books and you think that's an actual possibility that can happen. That happens with board games where you're like, oh, I want to play them all. I want to try every board game that was ever made. It's not going to happen. And at the time, I wanted a huge collection too. Like, right, there's a bit of ego here. I, I wanted to be able to brag, go, hey, I have 500 games. That's more than this person on Reddit. Uh, and while some people don't ever leave this stage, I do think it does eventually hit everyone, whether you think it will or not. If you can afford it, at least. Yes. No, you can always get that. We've talked about it on the show. I'm not going to get into it, but you can always get someone else to buy the games for you. That does work for some groups. Now, another stage or maybe subset of the curation stage, Sean kind of alluded this to, to this a bit, is what I'm going to call the bling stage. It's where you realize you have enough games. Now, Razuel's right there. He mentioned it right in his question. I got enough games. How about instead I make the games I own better? You're doing box inserts, custom meeple, metal coins, uh, main, uh, score sheets, reference cards, big boxes that fit all the expansions, buying expansions, getting all the expansions, getting the fan created content, getting print and play add ons, going and getting to cons to get the special promo that's only available at Essen. There are countless ways you can improve the games you already have. To me, this is a stage all about enjoying the games you know you love and making them more fun. And honestly, this is like a happy place. This is a good stage to be in, in my opinion. Yeah, this can be, but isn't always related to the curation stage in my mind. Uh, often as part of the curation, you're looking to improve what it is you're keeping to help add value to it for your collection. Yes. Now, the bling stage seems to be a hit or miss thing. I, to me, it's not average, it, but it seems to hit some people hard. Some people get there and others never do. But like locally, except for miniature gamers who are all about collecting the nicest army and customization and magnets and all that stuff. And there's a lot of that that happens in Windsor, especially with 3D printing nowadays. There aren't a lot of people who bling out their games. There are a couple of us, uh, but most locals I find are more interested in spending their money on new games. The blingers are out there, though. Just one look at Etsy and type board game or a component upgrade. You can see just how popular improving existing games has become. Yeah, and the and the, the huge growth in 3D printing has really driven this. Yes. Uh, and I know, I mean, heck, I'm I'm a sucker. I've played um uh that card, the new card game from Garfield once, twice with you. Yes. And I yet I have a full set of wooden tokens and dials to to play it with it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Keyforge, Keyforge. Keyforge. Yeah, that is something I'm missing. I'm sorry, we're failing here because Razo actually asked for specific games at each stage. Uh, for Bling, for me, it was box inserts. I definitely did a bunch of box inserts for games I enjoy, but one of the ones I blinged out was Lords of Waterdeep. I went and got the D&D pulls. I went and got the box insert that fits the expansion and other. So there's an example of a game that I went and blinged out. Yeah, for me, Key Forage, uh, but then I also made sure I went out and got the uh, the full expanded multiverse box for DC so that I could properly right. manage and maintain all the cards. And then I've got the playmat, another playmat coming and a new multiverse box there coming with the Kickstarter 
um, that yep. uh, that just ran. So my bling is uh, DC card collecting. There you go. Now, on another stage that the blingers love, but non blingers do as well as the show it off phase. Now you have all these games, you want to share them with others. Uh, this could start right when you discover. It could be the first time you play. You're like, oh, my God, Catan's awesome. I must tell all my friends that that was me. I was like, I'm going to invite different people over every weekend. Well, I'm going to start with like, OK, the three of us. It was me, Dean, Sean Skolak, not Sean Hamilton or Sean from Hamilton. Um, we're playing Catan and we're like, oh, this is good. Let's invite someone else. And I think it was Snail Runs in the chat who joined us first. They're like, okay, this is too good. Oh, there's an expansion. We can play five to six players. Okay, now we're gonna invite uh, a Mike over and someone else. And and then we're like, okay, we need two copies so that we can have two tables going at our Catan night because more people have to discover this. And then I'm like, you know, we could like get together at the Knights of Columbus and I could teach people to play Catan. Though at that point, I was also into Power Grid really big. Um, the World of Warcraft board game was big, and that that was in 2003. Um, I started running public events um this could happen right away or it could happen once you start collecting when you're trying to buy them all you want to show them off or once you're curating especially if you curate you got to show off this curated collection or if you bling right um once <laughs> I, I like i founded the windsor gaming resource i started hosting game nights so i could tell more people about this hobby i i became an ambassador of board yeah. games and well i'm still here talking about it so yeah some people just go and show their friends you on the other hand went out made new friends and found complete strangers to yep. show your games off to now this is likely a personality type outside of the norm where the average person would just bug your your friends to play every new game you got yep yeah I, i'll admit it <laughs> i'll admit it now of all the things mentioned so far um this one definitely probably is a step that not everyone's going to take, right? Uh, it does take a certain type of personality to want to show off your hobby to the world. Um, while I'm sure every gamer is going to hit a point where they're going to want to share their games, many are going to stop once they find friends. Now, I got to say, like, if this goes back to the original start of this where I was talking about how I got started with my dad had a collection. Well, the sad thing about my dad's collection is he didn't have anyone to play with. There were, there were he had a couple people to play with, but not enough. And I think knowing my dad had this collection of, at the time, over 100 bookshelf games which was massive and un unheard of and oh my god most dad has so many games but couldn't find anyone anyone to play i didn't want that to happen to anyone else and i used the bad trope i used to say the windsor gaming resource was getting gamers out of their basements right i'd no longer use that term but it was just the goal was to get people out gaming with other people and get those games played for me i wanted more but that's not going to be for everyone uh, just about the only thing Mo didn't do is start his own FLGS, though I'm not certain it didn't strongly cross his mind. Yeah, we uh, we tried to make an offer on Hugh Munin to Ian when he decided to close the shop, and <laughs> it did not go through. So yes, that definitely happened. <laughs> and I wish it had gone through at this point. I think it might have turned out pretty good. Now, another stage that for me hit near the end of my got them by them all stage is the con goer stage, um, which could be maybe like a smaller version would be the public play stage this is when you not only game with your small group of friends but start gaming with strangers whether that's not necessarily just like to show off your games this isn't it's a different thing it's i want to play more games with more people i want to spend more time gaming i want to learn more games and strategies it's more that feeling than a hey look at my stuff now this could be a local gaming event or store but generally this tends to eventually get to gaming conventions once you're looking at conventions though there is a lot more to it than just playing games right there are lots of reasons to go to conventions other than just showing off your games or playing games they're a great place to learn about new games a place to try before you buy a place to go shopping a place to find harder out of print hard to find or out of print games or even better in my opinion one of my best things is a place to hang out with like-minded people and talk about games there are actually a lot of paths i feel that lead to this one uh, yeah. For me, going to cons was always pretty natural because conventions were something that I attended regularly for work as staff mm. in a wide variety of fields from uh, finance to supercomputing to gaming and uh, tech, you know, uh, public tech, tech cons. Uh, it was just what people who liked something got together and did. That yep. just made sense to me. Now, I know many gamers who never hit this point, but I also know a ton that once they attend their first con, they never look back and try to attend more and more. Uh, many people in groups have set cons they attend every year. They obviously hit these ones. Uh, personally, we were just at that point 
of having a set of cons we always attended and trying to hit more every year when uh, the COVID pandemic hit. And while we're still in the middle of it, this stage. So we only really started hitting cons either 2015 or 2016. I meant to check that stat before we went live. It was Origins was our first big one. But like, yeah, I'd gone to Windsor Gaming Fest, but like, that's not a real con. <laughs> no offense to old gamers who ran the Windsor Gaming Fest that were that old. They're probably 18 at the time. Felt old to me because I was like eight. Uh, <laughs> but I think most gamers hit a point in their gaming life where they at least consider going to cons and end up having to make a decision whether to go or not. Yeah, one of the biggest stopping points with cons is people. Uh, mm. I know I struggle with crowds, and board games are one of those hobbies that you can enjoy quietly with a few close friends and stepping mm -hmm. up to a place where there could be hundreds or even thousands of other excited gamers can be a big and sometimes overwhelming step. Mm -hmm. I honestly, for the, the average gamer, I suggest you try. If you're not overly comfortable with crowds, like you're okay with it, go with your group. Go there to play games. Go to the demo room. Do, yeah. do, shop together, right? Don't don't venture into the crowds without your support network. Yeah. But go but again, with if your you're support not, network and enjoy yeah. it. <laughs> but again, I'm not trying to gatekeep this. Like, you don't have to go to cons to be a real gamer. None of this. Told you, as, I, as we said at the start, this is not a the proper path, the one true way to do things. But I do encourage anyone who hasn't done a con who is at least interested, give it a shot. The next up, up is the, the dreaded purge, a word that makes some board gamers run away and scream in terror. Uh, this is when you keep curating, right? And you're curating and curating, and then something snaps, or maybe it clicks. Maybe it's a light bulb turning on. You suddenly realize, I don't need all the games anymore. Not only do you watch what you buy, you start to remove games from your collection. You look at the games your own and start realizing, I haven't played that in years. Sometimes, for some people, this means getting rid of almost everything. Just keeping a small core group of games you love. Note a small core group could be 100 or more. Um, for others, though, this means following some kind of one-in, one-out system. If I buy a new game, I'm going to get rid of an old one. For me, this stage hit once I ran out of room for new games. I honestly, up until that point, was like, why would I get rid of any of these? I got room. Like, if nothing else, I can sit back and go, wow, look at all the games. And I feel good. I feel happy looking around my game room, looking at my collection. I have a big game room. I have 12 six-foot bookshelves down there, not counting a couple cabinets as well. But once those were completely full, including stacks on top, and I had a pile of games that were starting to build up on a chair that I couldn't put away. It started to make a lot more sense to get rid of games I no longer play. Now, the interesting thing I found about this stage is though, while it took a long time to get there and even longer to finally get rid of that first game, once I got rid of that first one, it became easier and easier as time went on. I think the big thing was realizing those first few games I got rid of, I didn't miss. Now, I personally have a long way to go here. I've got probably 100 games sitting here beside me in this room that are on the chopping block. Uh, my big problem hasn't been that I don't want to get rid of them. It's been the pandemic and time. Finding time to check the games to make sure they're complete, figuring out reasonable prices, listing them for sale, figuring out somewhere to meet up with people. And it just it's, it feels insurmountable at this time with everything else going on. So I, I think at the beginning of this, uh, this little section here, you described yourself as a board game dragon. Right, uh, there sitting, you go. sitting there and staring at your hoard and enjoying <laughs> the fact that you have this gleaming hoard of board games in front of you. Uh, There's probably a parallel there. <laughs> but now also, uh, when it comes to the purge, Canada is a smaller market with more expensive shipping. So taking advantage of things like eBay or board game geek deals and math trades can be harder here, mm -hmm. which makes the purge portion more difficult because no yes. one wants to throw out a game. I mean, getting rid of a game is one thing, but throwing it out is un unthinkable for the majority of people unless it's, uh, you know, horribly damaged beyond. Yes. Um, I hear, I'm going to throw in a stage here that's going to horrify people even more than The Purge, and that is the recycle the cardboard for the expansions. There's a stage some people are scared to death of. Yeah, I did that right away. I, that was yeah, too. see? Sean had no problem with that <laughs> Went one. into the multiverse box and all the cardboard went away. Oh, I, I had friends that were so disturbed I did it, they asked for all my boxes <laughs> so they could protect them. 
um, which I think got turned into art projects. Yes, hoarding empty boxes. Uh, my big one right now is X-Wing ship things, the plastic things, because honestly, they are the best way to protect the ships. But they are taking up a ridiculous amount of room in my 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 uh, laundry room. <laughs> and I'm like, I probably should just get rid of them. Like, my ships are mostly in a miniature carrying case now. Am I really going to go and put them back into all these plastic things? But then I'm like, if I ever decide to sell them? And that's the thing you always think, right? That that's what catches these people. Who are like, what if I ever want to sell that expansion? I'm like, well, how are you storing it? Is it in your base box? I'm pretty sure whoever gets it's going to be happy with it in your base box. And yes, there's going to be people out there like, what? It doesn't come with the expansion box. There's lots of other. As, as I said before, those, those those Uber gamers, the people who take things that seriously are not the majority. They just happen to be pretty loud, like us. Anyway, that was that was a side path. That was a, <laughs> a divergent path of, of recycling cardboard. Um, Now, the purge. I, believe it or not, I know people are out there. I, I denied it for a long time. I think everyone does get there at some point, uh, whether they expect it. Now, some people get to it way before I did. Um, we talked about Neil and his group of gamers on the podcast a few times, though it's been a long time. He is the big board game buyer for the group, picks what they're going to play, and they have, I can't remember exactly, they have an exact number of games. We're going to say it's five in their collection at one time. But they go all out on those five games. They play multiple times a week, and they bling these out as much as possible and make sure to get all the things. This includes house rules, promos, um, any little thing that like fan made print and play 3d printed whatever these games become their lives until they're sick of them then they sell that game off and replace it with a new one now because of all the work neil does blinging these games out he usually makes money on all these games he literally like makes a profit every new game he does and that funds their next game and makes neil a little bit of money on the side for example scythe right we review scythe we're all really enjoying scythe well, I finally posted about Scythe. He's like, it's about time you turn around on Scythe. Because I admitted that, that was part of my first place. The Scythe weren't so great. Because, well, I played with the super blinged out extra, all the extras in it version. They had played Scythe 55 times before doing the Rise of Fenry campaign, which they enjoyed enough. They bought a second copy and did twice. They had every expansion. They had the metal coins. They had box inserts, the big box, the play mats. They were eventually done with Scythe. Sold it all for more than enough to get them the next game they're into. Not my path, but that is definitely a path. This is, of course, a unique, some might say, fixation. Not all groups are going to be able to or want to focus in so narrowly. But for them, it works and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It's not a bad way to do it. I actually know a lot of people with the in and out. They, they, they get their clay, they purge, till they get to whatever arbitrary number they pick. And then it's it, it's when one come, game comes in, one goes out. I think even Tom Vassell does that. Now, for most folks listening right now, you probably haven't reached this stage yet, but we'll get there eventually. Assuming you ever got the acquisition, you know, got to buy them all. If you're, if you're just a game player and not a buyer, you don't have to worry about this one so much. Now, even the people I know with collections multiple times larger than mine, yes, there are some, and yeah, they're in Windsor. They purge. Uh, for one of them, it's a once a year thing. They sit down once a year. It's a January thing. It's like, you know, start of the new year. Let's purge. And another, it's just kind of like uh, they look on their shelf and go, man, I haven't played that in forever. And I have no desire to time to get rid of it. The key I find is to keep things that uh, to not keep things that don't make you happy. Too many games, games you don't like, games that ended poorly, games that broke up friendships. Uh, get rid of them. Uh, too many games making you feel anxious. Get rid of some. Thanks, Marie Kondo. <laughs> now, to be fair, I've been doing a lot of personal purging, not games, but in my life recently as part of this move. So yeah. that's just kind of by, been my uh, mindset of late. Lost Cities Rivals. Does it spark joy? No. Not even a little bit. <laughs> not even a little bit. <laughs> um, game examples. There's one. Like I said, I have 100 in here. I, I am now constantly one of the like, like. Not a hobby, but like when I'm sitting downstairs waiting for something, whatever that happens to be like, like I'm waiting for D to come down or one, we're playing a game and someone goes to the bathroom or someone's got really bad AP. I now look around my room and I'm evaluating everything I'm looking at. And, and I'm thinking, oh, it's been so long or the, the opposite. Oh, man, it's been too long since we played that. What I really would love to do, there's just not enough time in the world is I want to play everything in my collection once and decide if it stays or goes. 
Like just starting at A, play them all and go, okay. Some I don't even need to. I can literally just purge them now. But there's enough that are like, you still like that. Would I still like it? Or man, you know what? I've had that game for 12 years. I played it once, but it was good. We just never went back to it. Is it really good? Or should I just get rid of it? I I, I would love to do that. Next up, we have a stage that I haven't reached, at least not yet. And that's the quit. You've had enough. You're done. I, I don't want to play hobby games anymore. Purge your complexion. All of it. All gone. Now, this can happen for a number of reasons, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. So I got to say, every gamer you tell it to is probably going to feel a little sad. You may be that you find you just don't have time, right? You're not playing them. You're looking at your games. You're like, when's the last time we had a game night? Maybe you have other obligations. You're busy with other things. You realize, you know, it's games. There are more important things I can spend my time on. Or you just can't afford it anymore. Now, in general, that's not that bad because it's not like the games you already own uh, you know, are no longer playable. Uh, maybe you're just sick of feeling you're missing out the FOMO. A lot of people I've noticed are getting out of the hobby because they feel they can't keep up. They can't keep up with all the Kickstarters and all the expansions and all the miniatures and get everything painted. And it's just too much. And it becomes an anxiety issue for them and they quit. Now, hopefully the issue isn't community related, though. I like things seem to be a lot more diverse and welcoming than they were, say, even 10 years ago. But I think we can all admit there's still a long way to go. So I hope no one's chased anyone out of the hobby, but I know what happens. Uh, the main thing here is there are lots of valid reasons for exiting the hobby, and no one should judge anyone based on the decision to do so. It could be as simple as using your board game collection to finance a new stage in your life. Got a baby coming? You can pay for a lot with those 1,500 board games. <laughs> yeah. Now, another step along the path is what I want to call the Epicurean or the taster, maybe the visitor. You want to try all the things. Now, this is similar to got to catch them all and can be part of the same phase for some people like me. Um, but I've seen this actually more on non-collectors, non-game buyer buyers, people who attend public play events, game nights at friends and cons just to try new games. They have no interest in building a game collection of their own, but love playing games and discovering new games. Now, if you're the collector in your group, the rest of your group, it likely falls into this category. And I think the average board gamer, the, the people who consume media instead of create it, fall in here as well. They love games, always looking to try new games, but it's something they just enjoy doing and nothing more. Yeah, I came to this stage, uh, I guess, a little un unnaturally. Uh, it just kind of comes as being part of being friends <laughs> with Mo. Yeah, I, I force <laughs> my friends to be Epicureans. Well, they have the option not to game. Be like, hey, I don't want to play anything new, but I'm going to be like, hey, we're playing new games this weekend. Especially <laughs> I'm now that we got a pile of the podcast, so I can't. Yes. Uh, I <laughs> definitely, true. definitely have to uh, take some blame for wanting new stuff all the time. Now, the opposite end of this also exists. The lifer, the, the person who takes one game or a small subset of games, and that becomes all they care about. Now, this is extremely common with miniature gamers and collectible card gamers, but it happens with all kinds of games. Heck, I was a Catan lifer for a year or so. And before I found the board game Geek Top 100 and started discovering other games, there are a lot of people out there that find a game they love and stick with it without any interest in trying anything new. At this point in 2022, this is most likely the stage you're going to find the most gamers in when you broaden the scope to Magic, Warhammer, and Dungeons & Dragons. One of the advantages, though, of this this being into one thing big with a bunch of other people that are into it big is the community that you don't get just being Epicurean playing different games every week. Uh, many people probably have tales about this stage uh, related to magic in particular. Yeah. Uh, I know my wallet does. Um, <laughs> and, and there are different sort of uh, levels of this as well, you know, where as I was playing board games, but my money was all in on magic. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would, it was RPGs and there was other games in my life, but financially i was all in on magic and there was a lot of magic being played even between yep. board games and, and and rpgs we were playing you know if we had downtime the deck of magic got pulled out yep, definitely true for our group and i know people did both like like i some people in my regular game group play magic and and they had the whole thing where where they're like oh they discovered magic magic is awesome gotta collect all the magic and they stopped playing for a while and then they had a purge and they got rid of all their cards but then someone invited them to a sealed deck night and they're like, oh, magic's fun. And they got back into it. Like, I know someone that directly followed that path, but at the same time, they were playing board games, but they don't own a single board game. 
like Sean said, they play mine. Now, the past we've talked about so far mainly deal with collecting, right? Being a board game collector, it's it's collecting, getting, as well as playing, playing different games. But nothing we've talked about yet is specifically what those games are, except specific games that fit into categories. There's also a life cycle for that, what games you're playing at a given time. And this one generally seems to revolve mostly around game weight. Now, when new to the hobby, most people are going to want to play games the same weight of whatever game they hooked them, even if they have no idea what the term game weight means. They want to play games that scratch the same itch, right? Make you feel the same. They're just as challenging. And for the most part, this is what hobby gamers like to call gateway games. But it could really be all over the place. Like for me, I discovered Euro games, right? Or German games. Right? It wasn't even Euro games when I discovered Catan. Everyone called them German games. And there's a reason for that. And I'm not going to get into it here, why they were called German games and why all these games did come out of Germany. And the differences. We have a whole episode about the difference between East and West Euro games and Ameritrash. You're welcome to check that out. But anyway, I discovered Catan and learned that's a type of game that I had not discovered before. So then I started looking for other Euro games. And that led me to discovering something called the Spiel de Jar, which is the, the game of German Game of the Year Award. And then I realized that the publishers, Mayfair and Rio Grande, publish a lot of these games. So then I just started looking for games by those publishers. And then I learned there's a thing called the Alia series. And they're published by all kinds of people, but it's a certain series of games that were kind of considered like the gold standard of Euro games. And there's a big box set and a low, small box set. My acquisition disorder went off and I tried to get them all. Now, I also started paying attention to designers. There's a point where I bought everything Claus Tuper put out because he was the person who designed Catan. And while everyone knows now, I'm a huge Stefan Feld fan. Uh, it also could just be in relation to other hobbies you have. Are you an environmentalist? Perhaps you enjoy games about safaris, birding, trees, or as we talked about earlier, hiking. Mm -hmm. uh, if your <laughs> love of all things X got you into gaming, that's just as valid a reason as wanting to play some games like that as just wanting to play something more interesting than chess. Or in your own personal path, it was a mechanic, a specific mechanism, style of game that you went and sought out more of. Now, for other groups, it seems to be similar, though. Um, with the Internet being what it is today, it's a lot easier to find. What else would I enjoy? I like this. I play Catan. What other games like Catan are there? What other games like Wingspan are out there? So newer groups may not be like, Going by publisher, like when I'm saying going by publisher, I'm like, I walk into the game store and I look for the logo of the box, right? Like it's kind of old school. Whereas nowadays, I think people are going to seek out games with similar weights, even if they don't know what weight means, right? They're going to get into the hobby through party games. They're going to start with code names. Then they're going to learn about Beastie Bar. And then they're going to try out Guillotine and Parade. Um, I know one gamer who got in through 18XX and then played a different 18XS and then another 18XX and then learned about Winsome Games and another 18XX but then eventually branched into Hex and Counter War games to block war games and so on. And as Mo said, for me, it was the deck building. I liked Magic, but I didn't want to get into a collectible card thing. I like building yep. decks and, and, and creating that engine and that deck that works, but I didn't want to get into collecting. And I found deck building as a mechanic scratched that itch. And mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I, I fell in love with. Now, for me, after discovering games like Catan, the whole Euro game thing, and trying out some of the other, like I had the board game Geek Top 10, right? So I tried an Ameritrash game on there, and I didn't enjoy them as much. I found what I was enjoying was the challenge of playing games. I liked having to think and plan out my moves, and that had me start looking for heavier games. This is when I start discovering things like the BGG weight, and I start hearing terms like weight and heavy games and light games and crunchy games. And I, I played all of the Aaliyah games. So what's next? What's a step up, right? At this time, I discovered podcasts like Heavy Side, Heavy Cardboard, Ryan Metzler from the Dice Tower. Um, that led me to trying heavier games. And then when I found I enjoyed those and I played a bunch of them, I started looking for even heavier games, right? I started getting into stuff like Arkwright and Splatter games like Indonesia. Now, at that point in my path, I had no interest in playing party games at all. I, I would even pass on older games that I used to consider heavy because they didn't feel heavy anymore, right? Like you just, you're more used to it anymore. Like I wouldn't play Catan during that period and Race for the Galaxy. Oh, that's a simple game. I, on the other hand, while I enjoy certain heavy, meaty games, 
if the theme doesn't do anything for me, the game becomes of little interest. Uh, you show me a heavy brain burner sci-fi and I'm all in. But yeah. if we're haggling about the price of tulips and fighting for maximum profit, I'm just not going to be invested. What's this tulip game? I think D might <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> so I actually think this one's pretty common, right? The, 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 like obviously, Sean did not quite go that way. But I think the, the, it's a pretty typical progression to start getting into heavier and heavier stuff, right? The stuff you originally learned don't feel as challenging or as interesting to you, and you need more of that meat, right? Uh, the entire term next deck games come from this. And the popularity of people talking about next step games kind of shows that there is this progression worth making by moving up from easier games to more difficult ones. Now, I got to say, some of this I'm pretty sure is ego, right? Like, oh, I play heavy games. You definitely hear that. But honestly, for many people, it's the challenge of them. The heavier games, they feel more rewarding when you win, that you accomplish something that makes them fun. Uh, Tulip Mania, 1637. Uh, <laughs> there you go. I'm just amused because you can't see this, people. Oh, you can see it in the chat, but those listening live didn't see Deanna immediately reply. What? what wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So while there's nothing wrong if that path isn't for you, yeah, uh, I would say for the most part that hasn't been my path at all. With no. more midweight being where I'm happy at, aside from a few reaches of specific themed games into mm -hmm. those, you know, heavier waters. I I have no interest in Power Grid. <laughs> yeah so i still kind of want you to play it i know so you can i know I'm going to play, I'm, i know i'm going to play it eventually, eventually but it's possibly just, going just to, to get be that once. check mark the yeah. i have played power grid and then you'll be like wow that was actually good even though there was mm. pretty pasted on theme <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's a path that we haven't talked about and i think some gamers go through is how important is theme to you and artwork in that um you're gonna shift from i like heavily thematic games to i like heavy crunch games so I think for most people, that's not as much a back and forth. Like, I don't think people dive heavy into theme and they're like, oh, I'm sick of theme. I need to play more abstracts. But I think that's part of the journey while you're doing the other steps. You're probably at least going to try the different ones and find ones you prefer other others. Now, the heavy game, right? The climb, we're going up. Everything's getting heavier. Eventually, I hit a plateau. I, I couldn't tell you exactly when it was. Um, at some point, the heavier games started becoming less fun and started to feel like work. Uh, I started to feel like I was doing homework to play board games and even learning to play some of these games felt like work. Now, I honestly think this hit me when there was a lot of other stuff going on in my life and my game nights became more of a place to relax somewhere where I just wanted to do some silly fun and hang out with people. But no matter what the reason was, I hit a point where I was kind of sick of the heavier games. Like, not only was I not interested in breaking out a calculator to play the final round of Arkwright, I was much more willing to sit down and play party games again. And that period was honestly somewhat eye-opening. Like, I was shocked when I'm like, you know what, I don't want to play anything. Let's just throw it, whatever, grab that stupid game. And I'm like, wow, that was actually fun. And and I'm like, wow, I rediscovered games like, like um, Rumble in the Dungeon, which is behind me here. I rediscovered the joy of simple dexterity games. And I like picked up a copy of Riff Raff off my friend Jamie. And it was a game I said I'd never play again at the time when he brought his copy over. And I'm like, I bought it off him and I loved it. I started playing Super Cats. Like it's a, it's a game where you're basically playing rock, paper, scissors. It wasn't that long ago either, honestly. Like for anyone who listens to our podcast might even hear some of that transition. I think it was near the start of our podcast when all that was happening. If you've been here since the start, you got, probably got to hear me shift from talking about heavier games into lighter and lighter stuff. There's a reason we're reviewing Mountains over, Out of Molehills tonight instead of uh, Shores of Tripoli. And it, it certainly helps when, if you've had a family, your kids get to a point of wanting yeah. to be involved. Uh, I don't think if you were just gaming with your usual Monday night group, you'd have had the same enjoyment of Super Cats as when you were able to watch your kids get really mm. into it. Yeah, very true. There was definitely the the playing games with the kids stage, which I, I here we go. Here's a path, part of the path we both went through playing games with their kids, passing on the torch. Uh, you're going to sit there at some point where well, you're not necessarily some gamers are going to have kids and then you, they have a decision to make. Do they want to share their hobby with their kids? They probably do. We have many episodes about playing games with their kids. The important thing I'm going to reiterate here is don't force them. It should be optional. Do not force your kids to play games. There's no quicker way to make them hate family game night than forcing them to show up and take part. 
Um, having kids definitely makes a big change in your gaming life from not necessarily being able to get together with your regular game group to playing different styles of games. Now, I think this whole progression of harder, heavier, harder, I'm enjoying more and more think to, okay, I'm kind of sick of this. I think this is pretty common. I see a lot of board game podcasters, reviewers, media going through this. Um, for a great public example of this right now, all you have to do is follow Eric Lang on Twitter and see his journey as a game designer where he went from games like Blood Rage, Rising Sun, and A Song of Fire and Ice miniature games to designing the very chibi, silly-looking Marvel United and spending most of his time on Twitter advocating for lighter games that can be taught on four or less pages. Yeah, there can be a personal development aspect as well uh, that you'll somehow feel better if you can beat harder games, perhaps only to realize that the games you enjoy laughing around a table with friends, whatever weight those games may be, mm -hmm. end up being the better games. Now, personally, I, where I am right now, I would say is a happy medium as far as game weights are. I still like games with some meat, and I would say mid to heavy weight euros are pretty much my favorite still. I like I'm not too heavy style side, you know, the threes and then in the board game, the three to three point fives, maybe reaching up a little higher. But I do occasionally love having a party game night where I'm playing games with a weight of one where I don't have to think too much. And then I can take those really heavy games. What I like to do with those is plan a specific game night. Plan ahead. We're going to play something big and meaty with a group of people who enjoy meaty games. So who knows? Three months from now, I might be on a heavy game kick and all about picking up the latest Vital Reserta game and playing that until uh, the dice are worn out. I dice give it till December. Game. Just a hunch. <laughs> there you go. So the whole thing here, though, is that this transition and shifting in all aspects are is normal. This is what happens. Why we call it a journey, not a straight path. We said this, this, this isn't a great path and it's not a bad thing. It's perfectly normal to uh, go backwards, uh, to purge your entire collection, only to regret it and try to rebuild it again, uh, to move away from silly games that don't mean anything to games where you can outwit no player your opponents and feel good about it. Only to swap back to silly games where you flush toilets or flip airplanes to knock over chickens. There's really no right way to approach this hobby except to try to have fun and make sure you aren't impacting the fun of others while doing so. So those are the ones we have noted down, but there is another one I have to call out that is a pretty obvious path that Sean and I are on right now. And that is at some point, maybe you take this hobby so seriously, you become a content creator. You like your game so much, you want to share them with the world so much, you start shouting out to the public to pay attention to you and what you know about games so that hopefully more people will discover this awesome hobby. This one obviously isn't for everyone. And as far as I can tell, based on most trends, doesn't last. It's a phase and people get out of it. They jump in and then they pod fade pretty quickly. Based on our uh, podcaster list, we have at tabletopbellhop.com, we have a list of master, a master list of tabletop gaming podcasts. I am trying to purge it. It is 1,500 line items long. And it's taking a very long time. I'm maybe a third of the way through. The number of podcasts I have had to delete because they have no content out has been staggering. It's about 50-50 if a show that is on that list is still live now, which is why I need to clean it up. Now, I will admit a lot of those are actual plays. RPG actual plays tend to last about a year, and that's about it. And then either they move on to something else or it pod fades. But still, there are a lot of people doing what we do. A lot of people get to this stage, but not a lot stick with it. Honestly, I don't expect to quit anytime soon. We have no plans to end. But like popular podcasts that we grew up with uh, are gone. Gaming and BS probably being the most recent one. Yeah, and I think a lot of people sort of uh, misunderstand content creation. Uh, there are a lot of myths about content creation, including the money available, <laughs> um, yeah. which, which isn't there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, you have to do this for the love. And what I think a lot of people um, who aren't, you know, listeners from the beginning, at least, might not know is just how long you've been doing this. While Tabletop Bellhop is still oh, yeah. reasonably new, we're only, you know, we're, we're still under 200 episodes. Uh, yep. The Windsor Gaming Resource, which was the original uh, iteration of your online uh, 
content creation persona yeah. goes way, way back. <laughs> Yeah, You've been doing this a long time 20 years. In, 20 years. in its two forms. Yeah, um, 20 years ago, I launched the Windsor Gaming Resource webpage, which was, I, it was early. It's been more than 20 years at this point. because Early in the year, and what originally it was is I had discovered RSS feeds, and there were a number of good board game news sites out there, Board Game Geek being one of them, but there were others at the time that were really good, and I wanted all the information in one place. And I made a list of the local game stores where you could buy games because this was the point where I discovered Catan and it was information I wanted that didn't exist. And that's where it came from was I didn't want to be my dad. I didn't want to be sitting in the basement with these games and not sharing them with people. And I knew other people were out there. So I wanted to get people to get together and play games. And shortly after launching, I hosted my first game event. We started doing game events at Hugin and Munin and it's just gone on since. Yeah, it's it's a shame we didn't pivot to uh, podcasting sooner. Well, yeah, um, and Sean, YouTube... Sean pushed me like way back, <laughs> way yeah. back. And, and I, th- I you it. know, again, we, we you know, it's it's not unthinkable because of the head start you had that we couldn't have been one of the big names. Um, yeah. I'm not saying we ever would have had cruises, but <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But, uh, you know, there there's there's there was enough ramp up time and we were digital early enough that we could have uh we, we could have although been, although i personally think if we had started back then with everything that went on in my life between then and now we would have quit we possibly. wouldn't still be here <laughs> there, there were some who knows if if i was talking games every night maybe some of the stuff that happened wouldn't happen <laughs> I, don't, I don't know I'm, I'm not a big regret look back for what could have been person yep. all i will say is we're not going anywhere now um this is definitely a path that many gamers take now of course there's a minor version right there's the Post all your games on Twitter, make an Instagram account, make a Tumblr, whatever's out there, make TikTok videos. You don't have to have a podcast. You don't have to do reviews. You don't have to become um, a, a, a content creator. You can share your love of video games, and a lot of people do that nowadays. But they do that with every hobby. That's that's not board game specific in any particular way. So that's, then, oh, yep. no, no, nope, no, no. Then okay. there's one more stage that oh, we haven't okay. gotten to is getting work in the industry, becoming a, a, a board game professional. Uh, no, we are not professionals, as you can probably tell by our quality and, and, and of, of our subtitles for one down below. Um, you design games, I, a fairly logical progression. So here's an interesting one. There are a lot of people out there that assume everyone who plays games seriously and takes it seriously wants to design their own game. I'm here to tell you no. I have no interest in designing a board game. For some reason, people think that's like the logical step is you do this, you play all these games, and then you make your own game and you get rich, which no, you don't trust me. <laughs> Just like there's not a lot of money in content creation. There's not a lot of money in creating games either. The select few who have very popular games, it happens. Um, so that is a step that we have not taken. I have written RPGs. I am much more interested in writing role-playing games than I am writing board games. I have no interest in developing a board game. At one time, I had an idea for deck shedding as a mechanic, but other people already took that and ran with it and did good stuff with it. All right. Well, uh, as our chat room knows, the final stage will be porridge, but I'll leave you to find that out on your own. So that's it for our talk of the life cycle of a gamer. Do your experiences match our own? What was your tabletop journey and what stage would you say you're in now? Let us know by commenting below, hit us up on social media, or send us an email. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Tonight happened to be a question from Razuel. Next week could be a question from you. To get your questions to us, head over to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop at the top of the page. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit me up on social media where I can be found everywhere. It's tabletopbellhop, one word.